without early information. And this is uh, work uh, done with Raffaele Marino uh, in the last year at Fuji before he became a Swiss. Uh, and uh, we asked ourselves um, we asked ourselves to investigate the simplest possible model in which some of the basic themes uh, in search could be explored. So I'm going to talk about community detection, but Everything that I have to say applies uh, to, um, uh, or yeah, I think everything that I have to say applies also to constraint satisfaction, to uh, the basic machine learning tasks, um, and they have to do with the they have to do with the difference. A critical difference that shows up is between searching for an acceptable solution when there are many solutions present uh, to a problem and searching for a rare and unique single optimal solution to a problem. Uh, in the first case, when there are many things to look for, there is not only the difficulty of navigating in a local potential which is extremely complex with, uh, with high-lying uh, early minima, which are far from the optimum which is being sought. Uh, there's a different kind of search difficulty that is easily isolated in the community detection problem, and that is what you might call entropic difficulty. There are many things to look for. Uh, in the early stages of a search, one gets hints that indicate uh, of multiple directions in which to search, uh, each direction uh, impedes the search for each, each, each of the goals which you uh, put together as in the early stages of a search make it difficult to find any of the others. And so the uh, total search is impeded or, uh, or undermined by the early confusion. And uh, we chose a, a series of algorithms to explore in which it's possible to do early cleanup of, uh, of mixed information or mixed directions rather than uh, solve such problems at the end of a search. Uh, secondly, there is a long history of exploring the phase structure uh, the easiest description is that many problems have gaps between what one can do trivially and what, can, what one can prove is possible and what can prove is impossible. And this gives a phase structure of easy, hard, impossible, which you saw in Federico's talk yesterday. Uh, but there's a richer phase structure which is known for uh, problems that have been explored in greater depth and using the advanced mean field theory methods that have arisen uh, with the understanding of replicas uh, and other uh, breakdowns of the phase space of random systems. Uh, the nice thing about community detection is naturally occurring communities with, uh, without a whole lot of pre-specification of what kind of community one seeks. Uh, have a complex and you know have multiple solutions. One can plant uh, communities or plant cliques in a graph uh, and reward entirely different search methods. And at the end, I'll show you that we have a case in which all of these elegant schemes that the literature is full of can be defeated in the case of a planted uh, problem by very simple methods. So. Uh, let me go down to the middle of this slide. Imagine a country, imagine a country with a thousand oligarchs, two thousand politicians, and five thousand journalists among millions of a population of many million. Uh, it turns out you might want to try to learn things about the social social communities in such a population, 
by understanding who talks to whom. And telephone data in Mexico permits exactly that. Now, in Mexico, the oligarchs are, are known. And it is a known fact that the telephone data connects all the oligarchs in a densely interconnected clique. So if we didn't know who was an oligarch, could we find that fact out by starting with the telephone data? Well, in fact, this is a good example where we probably wouldn't get very far because we might be given a hint. We might know that uh, uh, Carlos Slim, for example, is probably the oligarch, di, the, the capa di tutti capi. Um, so we start with him and we then add to the community uh, the person to whom, uh, who, who talks to him and has almost as many connections as he does. Uh, but that might be a politician. And no oligarch owns all the politicians. They each own just enough to do whatever oligarchs need to make their life oligarchical. Uh, so now we only have some of the politicians, but those some of the politicians don't talk to all of the oligarchs. And furthermore, if our next person added to the community turns out to be a journalist, we're hosed. We'll never find all of any of these communities. This is a good example of what I mean by mixed early information. We get confused. OK. A toy version of this problem uh, has had a, a long and enjoyable history of analysis. And that's, let's take a random graph, an erdos renyi random graph. To make it as hard as possible, we, we allow half the bonds to survive, chosen at random. And we look to see if we can construct a maximum possible clique. The problem has a gap because uh, the algorithm that I described, start with the site with the largest number of neighbors, add to it from among its neighbors, which is now only half the graph, uh, the site with the largest number of neighbors. Add to those two the site in the quarter of the graph that is neighbor, a neighbor of both with the largest number of neighbors. Uh, you run out of sites to add at log base 2 or log base 1 over p, if p is the fraction of bonds of, uh, of n. And furthermore, it's a lovely phase boundary. It's an algorithmic phase boundary for this problem. Uh, you can do finite size scaling, but you, you should be careful. Because if, you, if instead of creating a fancy uh, uh, tightening up uh, finite size scaling plot, you simply shift each threshold by log base 2 of n, you will discover that at every value of log of uh, where log base 2 of n passes through an integer, uh, you're likely with, these out, with this uh, simple algorithm to find a solution to run out of space maybe one or two before the threshold and to be able occasionally to find a solution maybe two or three steps beyond the threshold. So instead of having a width which is a rapidly, which is sharp, which is a power law with an exponent less than one, uh, this threshold has a width which is integer, a few integers on either side. So it's, a, it's actually a phase boundary with a softer threshold. And if you look carefully at a number of popular combinatorical problems where the solutions are a sequence of integers, that's not an uncommon behavior. So, just saying that it's a phase boundary was shocking enough in the world of combinatorics when, when this was first encountered that the distinction between softer and sharper phase boundaries has never really uh, received a whole lot of attention. And that's understandable because the study of this problem actually preceded the names P and NP and the question of whether they were any different. So what sort of phase boundary is this? I've said it's, it's soft, uh, but the natural question is, does it belong somewhere in the uh, Lenka cascade? Now, Lenka tells me it's not just Lenka, but it's on her thesis, so I think we should give it her name. And she's not here to defend herself. Um, the picture. The picture that we start with is, in fact, very much like this. Uh, but you notice we're not doing what, is, what this diagram is meant to characterize. Um, 
the cascade diagram describes a series of asymptotic solutions as one parameter, the ratio of links to sites, is made harder and harder, makes it harder and harder to find such solutions, and the solutions get fewer. Uh, but what, what I'm described, what I just described on the previous slide, is the search for larger and larger cliques at a fixed value of n. Um, so is the cascade the right way to think about that search, or is it a simpler, easy, hard, impossible uh, uh, sequence? And so the, the question will be whether uh, at either across the top, um, in what I'll show in the next slide, uh, is there a cascade with intermediate points of structure that can be separated by, uh, by more sophisticated arguments? Um, I think the answer is across the top, uh, there is indeed uh, such structure. Um, one of the nice things about uh, combinatorics is you can calculate the probability of anything if you characterize it precisely by just counting. So if you count, in other words, if you evaluate the expected number of cliques of a particular size in a graph of size n, uh, it's just... Uh, you know, n choose k times the probability that the number of links you're going to need uh, will be present. And in n choose k, you divide the multiple counting of the different ways to label things. Uh, the maximum size clique uh, is given by Markov's inequality. That is, if the expectation value for the number of such cliques is less than one, then the probability that there is such a clique uh, rapidly goes to zero. Uh, and you can also look at other things. But what this tells you is that the phase boundary, when the possibility of finding a maximum clique is not a smooth line, although you can approximate it uh, well at when p is close to a half and less well when p goes to zero or to one uh, with, a, with a smooth curve, it is in fact a staircase. So the phase boundary when we go up in size k uh, is a series of steps. And this, the surprise, before there was a general appreciation that boundaries like this must exist. There's a theorem by uh, Jean Bourguin, uh, uh, oh, Gil Kalai and his student uh, Ehud Friedgut all worked this out about uh, 25 years ago. Uh, they refused to commit themselves that there was a smooth phase boundary and phase spaces and all the things that we're familiar with from statistical mechanics. They simply said there is a boundary and they refused to say anything more about it and this is a good example why. This is a staircase with uniform steps on a scale of log n no matter how large n gets. The staircase never smooths out. Uh, what happens across the staircase is interesting. Um, there's a concentration result. If you go to the second moment, uh, with the first two moments of any distribution, you can, if the distribution is on the integers and positive integers, including zero, you can separate the probability of not seeing something from the probability of seeing some number of that thing, in this case, cliques of the maximum size. So at, at, the st at a staircase boundary, we go from one value of k max, uh, and the likelihood that all you're going to see is k max it lies within this boundary. And the next value of k max, uh, the likelihood that you're going to see that lies within this region. Uh, using Chebyshev and Markov inequalities. It's a little trickier than that. That's a technical detail. But if you just use the second moment for the number of uh, such graphs, you'll get a lower bound of zero, which isn't very useful. So you have to focus the, the count for a positive definite second moment like quantity by looking only at graphs where there are at least some uh, of the uh, some cliques of the larger size. And that turns out to be the easier quantity to evaluate anyway. 
Therefore, you get a way of showing that only two values asymptotically, the step below and the step above, are really of interest. And in the limit that we pass through such a step, which we do every log, every time log n passes through an integer value, uh, the chance, the, no, the fraction of graphs in which you will, you will find the uh, larger, uh, the larger value uh, passes through one half. So it's, it's a kind of an, of an elegant, ev el elegant evolution of a problem. Now, what do we know about max cliques? Not about max cliques in particular uh, that would guide strategies for finding them in the asymptotic regime. Uh, they're rare. Uh, there's an expectation of one, but in fact, uh, there's an expectation of one, but only, you're only going to find them in half the graph. So in fact, it's a long tail distribution to the high end. And there, because there's only one, uh, you either find it or you miss it completely. They're small, they're size log n. Um, as you move across each of the steps, it just happens over and over again, uh, you, you go from a regime where there's a tiny, tiny probability that any given randomly selected site will touch a maximal size clique to where at the right-hand edge of the step, the number of such cliques you will see passes through uh, five, six, or you know, presumably somewhere up around Avogadro's number, you'll get uh, a much, you know, a much larger, a diverging quantity. Uh, so the only place where, so along each step, we clearly have a hard to easy transition. Uh, I don't have the, I didn't put the figures in the talk to show you, but uh, along the step, there is, there is never more overlap between isolated, the, along the step, the, uh, the combinatorial, the probabilistic method shows you that the likelihood that two of these maximal cliques overlap is basically just uh, a cross section. They, uh, they have shown no correlation. The overlaps are at most one or two sites. When you get to the right-hand side, side of a step, you, uh, you still have only uh, a handful of overlaps between uh, isolated maximal cliques uh, on any size that one would ever do computer experiments for to be able to check. If you continue, if you look at cliques which are two, three, four, five sites, less than the maximal clique at that value of n, then you begin to see a regime in which uh, there are clumps of cliques. Uh, to go back to the, uh, the Lenka cascade, what the intermediate phases in which you'll see clumps of cliques as well as isolated solution is present, but not for cliques at the maximal size on their own special step. It is present in the growth from uh, easy to find cliques to almost impossible to find cliques. So there are, there are points along the Lenka cascade that we see in this problem. Um, there's a, a literature um, which peaked in the late 1990s around, and maybe early 2000s with a DIMAX uh, workshop at Rutgers. Um, that's, those are small, quickly written papers with tables, some of which contain encouraging results, and they're hard to read. We've, we've found that you can uh, restate much of what was done during that period uh, within a single model. And so uh, without discrediting all the work done back then, <coughs> we've been able to do as well and maybe a little bit better. And so I'll show that in the next couple of slides. Um, Oh, the nomenclature, the SM doesn't really mean very much, but any call SM Scott's method, or it's actually Raffaele's method. Uh, SM0 is a moderately smart version of what I described in trying to find oligarchs in Mexico, Mexican telephone data. Uh, pick a site at random, you know, or somebody hands you an oligarch. Uh, 
uh, because uh, he has a whole lot of connections. So pick a site at random with the most, or pick a site with uh, the most connections, add to it a neighboring site with the most connections in the space that remains, and do so until you can't do any better. <laughs> SM1 is do SM0 on every site and keep the best result. Do SM, SM2 is pick the link with the most neighbors. Uh, or, uh, I'm sorry, SM2 is uh, try every link. Uh, and from that point on, follow the SM0 methodology and keep the best result. And what you can see is that the harder you work, the closer you get to the staircase. So this is the dumb result. Log n. This is the smart result. It's a huge improvement over the dumb result. You have to work uh, every time each of these lines is another factor of n more work. And the reason you have to pay a full factor of n is because you're looking for many things. And so this, this is the cost. Uh, the cost of confusion is this power of n for each improved effort to follow the details of the staircase. And you'll notice it only works to a moderately, to a number that today would be considered embarrassingly small, 5,000. If we want to go further, uh, you can take these 1990-ish uh, algorithms and do what amounts to early cleanup. And what, what we did was uh, SM0, uh, stopping when SM0 stops, because that's super quick. And then, uh, as N gets larger, uh, selecting from that, from that uh, intermediate size clique subsets uh, and, and choosing all subsets of, a, of, a, of an optimal size from those subsets, exploring the best answer you can get, maybe even doing that a couple of times. That is, uh, re-subsetting, re-cleaning, uh, and then going from that. So this is, in effect, a, an algorithm with a cost of, did, did we start with SM0 or SM1? Zero or one? Zero. OK. So this is, in effect, the linear time algorithm with, uh, with a logarithmic cost, a, a fairly expensive but logarithmic cost uh, for local search. Uh, so it's local search with cleanup after completing the, the best inexpensive local search. Uh, and the reason for the two staircases there uh, is that the lower staircase is the best result you would get if instead of cleaning, you started with a randomly selected uh, subgroup or uh, of the size that we selected only from the solution to SM0. As, as a starting point. So we're better than any, we're better than any randomly, we're better than any randomly selected subgroup of that size and still falling below the answer. And we fall below with a slope which shows that we're asymptotically not on the right scale. Uh, so that I would say is a, a qualified it's only a qualified success, but ultimately it shows that uh, the local search does not solve the problem uh, in the limit of large n. On the other hand, it might be good enough for uh, you know, government work. Now, supposing we, for the rest of the talk, I'd like to shift to looking for just one thing, uh, where the cleanup issues are, can be held to the end. and. Uh, I'll summarize a lot of work by indicating, by suggesting that there's a, a large number of papers which tackle these problems using spectral methods. Uh, the spectrum of interest is the spectrum of the adjacency matrix, or matrices uh, derived from the adjacency matrix, the connections uh, be between the sites in the graph. Um, those are minimal in the same sense uh, that our linear algorithm is minimal. That is, uh, with a data structure of order n squared, the, uh, the adjacency matrix, and of order n work, 
added to that, one does the best we can. Uh, the short answer, but I'm going to spend some time explaining it because it's interesting, to, it's, it's worth knowing about, uh, is that um, cliques, planted cliques of size square root of n, proportional to square root of n, can be found by the spectral method easily if your uh, clique is some uh, large fa factor alpha times square root of n. So for, for simplicity of proofs, set alpha equal to 10, and you can learn a great number of things from the spectra. And there are good, good uh, uh, linear algebraic methods that uh, tell you things about the states, the eigenstates of this particular random matrix. But if you want alpha to become 1 or less than 1, things get a lot harder. The uh, spectral methods in the literature run out of steam, and a linear algorithm from uh, Dekel et al. also runs out of steam a, a little bit above 1. Uh, and we found some tricks that can, in fact, push it below 1. Uh, below 1 if you use a hint and all the way down to 1 uh, if you correct for the cheating that goes into using a hint to get there. So uh, currently, the clear winner in uh, general methods for searching for a planted clique in a random graph at p equals 1 half uh, are belief propagation, uh, a, uh, a belief propagation algorithm that comes out of the AMP work from, of uh, Montanari and various colleagues. Uh, is shown to be capable of extracting useful information down to alpha of 1 over square root of e. And uh, they've produced uh, numerical examples. I'll, I'll if, in effect, repeat their work in order to comment on uh, some cautions that should be applied to the use of belief propagation down in that regime. And then finally, as a surprise, uh, we found that our local methods can also play down there. So um, not only our local methods, but the parallel tempering that you heard about yesterday all have succeeded in getting solutions below this uh, 1 over e line. Well, here's the 1 over e line. Uh, no, sorry. This is, the, this is the 1 over square root of e line. And parallel tempering, uh, which because it's rather expensive, doesn't go to terribly large samples. Uh, and our SM2 have been able to, re to obtain solutions significantly below that and almost down to the 2 log base 2 of n limit, uh, which is the uh, below which point you can no longer clearly distinguish a planted clique from the naturally occurring kind. Uh, so, it's kind of fun to think about uh, sources of uh, gathering information from the spectrum of a random graph. So I have to tell you, what does the spectrum of a random graph with a planted clique look like? Well, the, before you plant the clique, you have the usual semicircular distribution of states and one special state, which is the uniform state, uh, out at a half n. Uh, that uniform state isn't terribly interesting, except uh, there are some tricks to make it go away if you want to use things like power method to more rapidly evaluate states at the edge of the distribution. The spectrum of a complete graph is a delta function. Actually, it's two delta functions. There is a state associated with the uniform eigenvector across the planted clique, and the rest are a small negative number, and of course, degenerate. Uh, when you join them, what you get is one eigenstate, sorry, one eigenstate that lies outside the semicircular band. And the rest of the states that uh, were that were originally uh, associated with the hidden clique are all hybridized into this uh, band of random states. Uh, 
Uh, I grew up learning about uh, Vanier functions and tight binding wave functions for uh, electronic states in the gap of a semiconductor because that was an interesting problem for a long time. Uh, and that's, that to me is what the problem of diagonalizing this random matrix is like. So in effect, this is an imp there's an impurity band of states that are, derives from the uh, hidden, the planted clique, and, it's, and it sits in the middle of this uh, random, of the random uh, quasi-localized states that are derived from the erdos rheny overlaps. Uh, that insight makes you think maybe we should take one of the sites, maybe we should take one of the sites in the graph or one of the sites in the planted clique if we have a hint to get us there and use it to pull the other sites in the planted clique out of the band where they can be inspected. And so that was the approach we took to see if we could push the limits of the spectral method down to one alpha of one or below alpha of one. Uh, if we don't use the trick, the uh, special state from which the planted clique can be extracted uh, disappears at alpha of about one, just below 1.2, and that's dependent on n uh, as well as uh, alpha. If, uh, if we have a hint, and the, what you see on the right is the, the, all of the uh, states on the planted clique, uh, as we decrease alpha, and you see with a hint to pull that up towards the upper edge of, the, of this random band, you can keep, you can keep all of that information uh, away from the background of the spectrum of the uh, adjacency matrix of the erdos rheny graph. So it works. Uh, but I have to be honest about that. We were able to extract useful information about the planted clique, uh, and I'm not going to go through that in detail, well below alpha equal to 1, down to about alpha of 0.75, which is not quite as far as 1 over square root of e, but we used a hint. Now, each hint throws away half of the sites in the graph as obviously not being connected to the hint site and therefore not a member of the planted clique. Uh, so take the square root and that says we should only be uh, down by about a factor of 0.75. So in effect, the, the hint really didn't gain us anything. And the, I would say that the limits of the spectral method are still, as far as we know, uh, an alpha of one. So now, uh, let's, let's ask, uh, what can we do to go below alpha of one? Well, belief propagation uh, uh, can be shown to contain some chance, some non-zero chance of extracting information down to one over square root of v. But our local methods have a unique advantage when there's only one thing to look for, and that is they can stop when they find it. What we discovered is it's actually remarkably easy to find a planted clique if you get anywhere close to it. And I'll show you how that works. Um, so we did one final competition. Uh, we set n equals 10 to the fourth and uh, ran belief propagation on smaller and smaller uh, planted cliques. Uh, and we also ran early stopping versions of SM1 of SM0, no, SM1, and SM2. Uh, belief propagation finds a solution for this fraction of the graphs on which we ran it. And I know from uh, running competitions with computer experiments, if your heart isn't in it, you don't run as many samples as you do when your heart is in it. So our data is kind of crummy, but the fact is that the fraction of graphs for which belief propagation uh, extracts essentially all of the hidden clique uh, drops to a tenth or less at 1 over square root of e. And the nature of the belief propagation is if it doesn't find the good fixed point, it goes to a fixed point with no useful information. So it's all or nothing. Uh, the cool thing about the local search methods 
is they stop when they find anything bigger than a naturally occurring clique. Uh, even two or three sites bigger, because while they have now returned uh, and, you know, uh, you know, some expected number of sites, not all of which are actually members of the planted clique, there's a, a finite cost, a fixed cost, or I, I guess it's one, one power of n search that will uh, quickly restore the clique to its full size and, just, and eliminate the, uh, the uh, sites that don't belong there. So uh, we've, they, we essentially are able to find the, find the clique uh, and completely on those graphs in which we stop, we find it all, just as BP finds it all or nothing. We find all or nothing uh, on a uh, group that go, on, on a, a fraction of graphs that goes down to zero at, uh, Oh, about four times uh, log base two of n, and uh, one and a half times log base two of n, or I'm uh, sorry, two and a half times log base two of n, using the more expensive method, and even the more expensive method, um, as you'll see here, stops so early that it runs in minutes. Uh, so, in effect, the the best way to tackle this problem. Uh, at a cost of uh, at a cost that is less than any other method uh, is local search with early stopping, uh, and the results are available. Results are available on uh, cliques which are too small to find that way. Uh, I make no claims about how this scales up to uh, billions as opposed to tens or hundreds of thousands. Uh, but, but presumably, this is the approach that is, uh, uh, that is appropriate for, uh, I would say, local methods that have the avail availability of cleanup and can stop early, uh, give us the power to deal with data sets of size up to about a million. Uh, and those problems abound, and they're of, of significant present value. So what have we learned? Um, as I, I, I would claim today's big data problems are within the range of all sorts of hybrid and less fancy methods, uh, and I've talked about some. Uh, doing computational physics on problems with this kind of simplification is a valuable uh, adjunct to uh, the Lenka cascade view of you know the uh, look, looking for the whole nature of the phase boundaries, uh, and finally, uh, combinatoric problems over the integers are definitely do definitely not definitely do not have smooth phase boundaries, and they are not as sharp as the phase diagrams that we have in physics. And it's possible that the phase diagrams that characterize glassy structure and glassy behavior may have some of the same uncertainties and uh, extra width. So that's it. Thank you. Thank you.